Rabbi Israeli, they're here from Baltimore. They moved here a couple years ago and um, a couple months ago. A couple months ago. It's been a okay. it's been just a year. Things up, right? Uh, and I'm, so I'm part of uh, Westwood uh, Beth Knesset and you know study there like I used to almost every morning with Roy Raynor here, the infamous. And um, and yeah, it's just been an amazing experience getting to know these guys and, and thank you for for helping us, you know, gain as much as uh, we can about trying to be a parent. Uh, there's a lot of people here that, you know, they're just, you know, they have a couple of kids. Some people here are expecting, and uh, it's it's just great to have a source for that knowledge. Thank you, Rabbi. Right. Rabbi yeah. Israeli, thank you. Okay. Thank you. This is a very warm um, introduction. Thank you so much, Abby, and Shirin for putting this together. Um, lots and lots of thanks to everyone that has pushed um, this event and one of the main main ones is, is Roy right here with the cell phone. <laughs> he really literally twisted my hand to um, for this second one. I, it was a very busy two weeks, past, uh, past two weeks. And he said, look, if Abby wants to do it, we can't say later. And uh, it, it's great to have, to, have, to have Roy, Abby, Shirin, Nahal, and all the other ones that, that really made this a possibility, made this, uh, made this evening, a beautiful evening possible. You know, we discussed some of the main things about what really parenting in, Hinuch, in Hebrew means last time that we started. I'm going to, with your permission, go quickly through some synapses of, 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 uh, of things that were discussed. And then we're going to take it, hopefully, to the second level. I realized that about maybe 50 to 60 percent of people who um, are here were not there last time. Um, so I'm going to discuss a little bit about basics for a few minutes, just to give you an overview of things that we did last time, and then we'll, we'll continue with Ezra Hashem. So Chinuch, and it's upcoming, yes. You can also see the last section. session. You can also see it, it's now on YouTube and, and our website also, right? Yeah. On W-E-B-E-K-E dot com. Dot com. That's, that's Westwood, Beth, Knesset, each one, two letters. So now, Chinuch means not raising kids, it does not mean education, it means preparation. Chanukah does not mean that you're educating your, the Mizbeach, the, the altar in, in the Beit HaMikdash, nor it means that you are um, starting. It means that you're preparing something that is going to be prepared for, for, for serving a specific purpose, a purpose in life. A child is going to become an adult human being and serve a purpose. A Mizbeach, an altar that's built in the Mikdash, in the tabernacle or in the in the sanctum of, of, of the Mikdash, in our temple, also has a purpose that you prepare it for. So raising children, basically in Judaism, means getting them ready for what they're going to be serving in future. It does not mean living through them things that you failed in life, now you're going to make sure to, to push it through and make sure they become doctors and lawyers and rich people and so on and so forth. It means see and realize the powers, the energies, the potential, the personalities, and the makeup of your specific child. And each one of them, I could testify, each one is completely different than the other one. Recognize their powers and enrich that, help them get up to where they could and be healthy human beings, adults, that they could serve their purpose properly in the world. So that's really, um, that's really chinuch, and we say in the Chadodi every Friday night, Sof ma'aser b'machshavat t'china. That means what you want to, to accomplish at the very end, in your mindset, it has to be in the very beginning. See what it is that you want your child to become in 20 years. What he could become, what he should become. And prepare him for that mission in life. That is the essence of Chinuch. You know, there was a beautiful study that they made in, in, one of the, in, in several high schools. They went and they had a stick. And they asked the kids to draw a straight line 
between point A and point B on sand. So each one of the kids took the stick, started doing it, doing it very carefully. And when they were done, they looked back and it was zigzag, it was baby. So one of the kids came and he drew a perfectly straight line from the beginning to the end. And they asked him, what did you do? He said, look, all the other guys, their eyes were exactly where the, the stick was. They were trying to make a straight line. I had one eye on the stick and one eye at the end. I had my goal in mind and in my eyesight every second. Same thing is in life. If you want to go straight in life, you have to have the last moment, the result in your mind in the very beginning. It's a beautiful research, one of my favorites, from, from Michael, um, um, Michael Joseph. He is the head of the, the Center of Ethics and has written beautiful articles. Um, he says, a person, and this is for, for ourselves, for getting, it, it could be applicable to raising kids, but he's talking for ourselves. He says, when a person wants to be successful in life, imagine yourself after 120 years of productive life, and you're in, in the funeral house when they're eulogizing you and you're flying on the wall and you're listening to the eulogies what do you want to hear? think about what you want to be eulogized as and remember it for divide them to three categories and those are your real goals in life and once you get that clear live your life backwards this is the same thing with the kids you have to have in mind, what can this person become? What are his, his shortcomings? What are his positive things? His strength and his, his energies and potentials and talents. And try to build it up, having what he could become realistically in mind in the very beginning. Those are, those are points of, 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 of real king. And the, really, the Pasuk says, Shlomo Melech, King Solomon says, if you don't have a vision for the future, the whole nation is going to fall apart. <coughs> having a vision, having a goal in mind, is the first and foremost thing in a person's life as an individual and in parenting as parents. That's very important to have in mind. Now, and we, we mentioned also that parenting starts, like, you know, most of the crowd here, they don't have kids above. 10. Is that correct? <laughs> Besides you, right? Right at 10. Right at 10, right? Mm -hmm. So we are all starting. We are basically all starting. It's, it's a young crowd and many people do, do not have kids yet. And that's not too early. You know, the age of, of raising kids, the age of chinuch, mm -hmm. when you start to teach them mitzvot and, and how to, to, to keep the Torah and so on and so forth, is about between somewhere between 7 and 10 based on how smart they are and so on and so forth. But parenting starts some 20 years before you have kids. And this is what Reb Chaim Balazhaner said, the first founder of the Yeshiva in Balazhan, when, when he was interviewed by the, by the magazine there in, in Balazhan, they asked him, us, the Germans, the whatever, we started at this and this age. What do you Jews do? And he said, we start 20 years before the child is born. We start working on ourselves on character. And that really is what changes the kids because they learn through having a role model. You know, most of the broken families, the kids who come from broken families, much of them, they decide, never again. It's not going to happen to me. And they go take classes, they do this, they do that. But the research shows that the majority of those who decide like that when it comes time to react to situations, they do exactly what they saw. It's very powerful. Our second nature becomes the nature of our kids. So therefore it's worthwhile to work on our character and our personalities because they don't know the storm that is going inside a person to get angry if you manage controlling it. They don't see the storm. They just see a calm face, and for them, that becomes their nature, to calmly deal with stress, to calmly deal with, with situations in life that could be hard. And that's something very important. It's worthwhile working on it, because a kid that sees stress at home, sees disrespect at home, they 
it, the chances are very low that they, they would change it for good, as, as the research shows. So it's, it's very important to work on ourselves. Years before the kids are ready for chinuch, for, for, for being really productive in community, that, that starts with ourselves. Now, um, <laughs> Actually, it's very, it's a beautiful thing that Mark Twain says, this is a non-Jewish non writer, he said, your, your, your actions are so loud that they cannot hear you. And this is, you know, putting it in one sentence says it all. Actions <coughs> speak much louder than words, and they are more, much more profound when it comes to scale of, of which one really works better. Because what you see is not comparable with words. A situation, if you would be to describe this room right now, you would, to someone that's either blind or closing his eyes, you would take at least five minutes. How long does it take for, for, for a person with eyes to, to, to grasp everything here? Second, two seconds, three seconds. What you see is extremely profound. You know, when, when, when I was studying medicine back, back in Iran, um, you know, the, the numbers were 90 to 10. 90 percent of our informations we get from our eyes, from what we see, our connection to the world is what we see. What the kids see at home is 90 percent of what they're going to become in future. So that's very important. Now, um, we also discussed, and this is, this is something amazing, I, I want to tell you a story that I heard from my, uh, one of my dear mentors, Dr. Palkovitz, he's, he's just an amazing, amazing source of, um, of research and everything. Um, a phenomenal psychologist. And he said a personal story with himself. He said, on Yom Kippur, he is in the shul. A diverse shul, very large shul. And he has, he, he told me, he said, I wish I had a way of recording this and I would show it to you. He said, there were two sets of three generation families there in front of me. A grandfather, father, and child, and another grandfather, father, and child. So one of them, all three generations were talking during the most sensitive part of the, the service in, in Yom Kippur. In Yom Kippur, right? Talking, the grandfather was talking to his friend of 70, whatever age he was, and the son, the next generation, was talking to his colleagues, and the kid was talking to his friends, right next to each other. And then the other three, they were a family that all three of them, they were, they were praying with intensity, with real intention and kavana. They were crying, you could hear them. It was such a positive influence for the whole synagogue, for the whole show. And so this is because this kid saw his parents do this, and it just runs down the, the next generation. And they, the sincerity and seriousness of Yom Kippur was shown by the parents to the kids and it was by osmosis absorbed to the kids that they just did the same. It's a powerful thing. There's nothing that could match that. And we mentioned Ben Sorer Morer that the one example that the Torah gives for a rebellious child, which the Gemara says it never happened. The punishment that the Torah gives for it is capital punishment. And the Gemara says this never happened and it will never happen. To which the obvious question is, so why write in the Torah? Something that's not applicable, you don't write in the Torah. And one of the beautiful things that our sages teach us is that the reason that this never is going to happen in Maras is because the voice, one of the requirements for this child to be put to death, the Gemara says, is that the parents should share the same voice, they should have the same voice. Which is, you know, obviously now you know why it doesn't happen. And the second one is, none of them could be deaf. So we mentioned last week that what the real deeper meaning of this is, that they should have a, a united front. They have the same voice. It's not that the father says something and the mother is, you know, just completely says something else. And vice versa. They have, in the main things at least, they have a united front when it comes to teaching. And the second thing is that they cannot be deaf to their own words. If you tell the, the, the kid, he can't speak in the, in, in the synagogue. And then he sees you on the phone. Or you say, 
you know, don't lie or cheat. And when someone calls and wants you, you say, tell them I'm not available, tell them I'm not home. So that's exactly being deaf to your own words. You're not hearing that you're preaching to them, which is exactly the same thing. So now, this is, these are some, some points that we mentioned last, um, in last session. Now let us discuss a little bit about the methodology of chinuch, the methodology of, of how to go about parenting when you're actively involved. First of all, it's, it's amazing that this, this night falls in the, during the week that the Torah itself pats someone on the back for issue of parenting. The first time, Abraham became the father of humanity. Hashem calls him, the Almighty calls him, Av Hamon Goyim Netatich. I'm going to make you the father of humanity. He was not biological father of humanity. But he is in charge of everything that goes around, around, around the world. And that was passed down to his kids, which is, which is us. And then the Torah gives a reason in, in this week's parasha that we just read. Hashem says, I'll translate, I'm going to give him this special role because I know that he is going to pass this down the generations and it's not going to keep it only to himself he's going to make sure that his values are shared with his kids this is the first time that the Torah pats someone on the back says I'm going to give you a tremendous mission because you're on top of your kids because your values you're not going to keep to yourself only it's going to be passed through generations so now um, parenting has two things and this is mentioned in our sages. I'm going to break it down and, 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 and see some, um, try to bring out some, some practical things. The Gemara says, the Talmud says in two places, in, in, in Sota on page um, 47, and also in Sanhedrin on page 107. It says, Le Olam always, Yeteheh Semol Doche Yemin Mekarevet. Your right hand should be pulling close, and your left hand should be pushing away. What the Gemara means is like this. Total bringing close and love and showering with everything that the kid wants is not the way to go. And having a lot of discipline also is not the way to go. The right hand, which is the strong one, should be pulling close and the left hand, which is the weaker one, should, should disappear. It's a mixture of both of them, which is very important. And we, we really find this by Abraham Avinu, by Abraham. He himself was, was um, caught, basically, by his wife on giving too much love to his son Ishmael. Sarah said, uh, look, you're giving too much love and you're overlooking the negative things that your son is doing. And he was upset about it. You know, he disagreed with his wife. And Hashem told him, everything that she says is correct. Sometimes it's time for discipline. And we find this time and again in the history of Jews that, let's say, David and Melech, David, King David had two sons who rebelled against him. And one of them even went as far and as close to kill his own father, King David. His name was Absalom. He rebelled and he made a whole mighty army and he went to, to battle and to kill his father. And the other one was at the end of David HaMelech's life and he was, his name was Adonia ben Chagit. These two boys were raised with tremendous amount of love. And when the verse says the story of the rebelling against the father, it gives the reason for it. It says, you know why? This happened because Asher, lo as Aviv lo asavo miyamav. His father, David, King David, David the Melech, never said anything negative to him. Never told him why did he do this. He never disciplined him. That's something very important to keep in mind because it, 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 as we as we're going to see today, we're not going to we're not going to be focused on on discipline. That's for next next session. But discipline is a very important part. It's a very important part 
but it cannot be overdone. It's the prime is be a certain distance that they know they can't do the wrong thing. A certain limit. Um, I have I have here also the, the pasuk says the verse says if you withhold your your stick from your child, what it means is that if you do not tell him and mention to him and relate the message that something that you did was not acceptable for our family, for our culture, for our values and standards, then you hate him. It's not that you. It's that's not called love. That's hating your child. So now. In our relationship with Hashem, we call Hashem Avinu Malkinu. We're just coming off of, off of Yom Kippur. And we said this so many times. Our Father, our King. And that's exactly the relationship that we want to foster with our kids too. We are mainly Avinu. We are mainly the Father, the loving Father and the loving Mother. And our hands are around our kids. But at the same time, there should be a, a feeling that there is authority at home. There is authority that you have to respect. There is authority that you have to follow. So now we're going to break this to to um, to two different categories of authority, and then spending time, quality time with with our kids. But as a preface to this, I want to mention a few points that I think are very important to know. First of all, you have to be yourself. People are different. There are people who are very liberal. There are people who are very strict. You cannot copy your friend, your neighbor, your rabbi, your colleague, no one. Some people by nature, they're just more loose and liberal and things go and come. And some people are very, you know, on, on the dots, exact and, and much more strict. You can't break yourself. Sometimes, maybe there's room for change, but as long as you're yourself, Hashem has given that intuitive feeling to the parent to know when things are right and when things are wrong, wrong. And you cannot be scared of making a mistake. That's the second point. People who are afraid of making mistakes in, in, in raising children, often they spoil the kids or they do too much or too little and it's just not going to work. We learn from our mistakes. You know, as, as, a, as a cute line you could say, that's why in Judaism the firstborns get twice. Because you make, that's, those are the guinea pigs, you, you, you <laughs> make all the mistakes and then you learn. But the truth of the matter is that a person, as long as he is fixing up the mistakes and you're learning, it's okay, the kids also understand it. You know, again, this crowd is much younger, you know, as the kids become eight, nine, they have that realization of what parents do. And they could even understand that the parent made a mistake. But they are very forgiving. As long as they realize that this is not the norm, they understand and they, they, you know, it's a healthy family. So do not be afraid of making mistakes. Because people who are afraid of making mistakes, they, they could never be successful. Be yourself and, and don't be afraid of, of, uh, of mistakes. And also, you have to realize that not everything is a big deal. Some people, you know, get freaked out. What's going to be with my child? He did this, he did that, he did the other. We're going to discuss this at length when we discuss um, discipline. But as a general rule, anything that they grow out of it, they're not going to be doing as, as a 20-year-old or 30-year-old. It's not a big deal. And also, I've got a secret for you. The secret is that many times, as long as you are... Um, you're not changing your methodology of life and, 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 and child, you know, the parenting and raising children, and you're consistent, it sits in, it could be 15 years longer. It could take 18, 20 years, but it's going to grow out of it. There is, I, I call this the, the Chinese bamboo syndrome. Has anyone planted Chinese bamboos here? No? Okay. This is what happens when you plant Chinese bamboo. Chinese bamboo, you have to plant it, and you have to keep on watering it, and watering it, and watering it, and watering it. And one month goes, two months goes, three months, a whole year, there's nothing there. Two years, three years, you have to water it. After four years, it starts growing and shoots up suddenly up to 40 or 50 foot top. This is Chinese bamboo. That is chinuch. 
because you plant and you water and you water and you wait and you're patient and you swallow and you bite your tongue and, and you do all those things and if you are consistent and it's a healthy family sometimes it could take 10, 15, 20 years but it's going to grow so don't get too nervous and freak out <coughs> this is what's going to be with my child look he, he broke this, he said this, he cursed he did. if you're calm and you're consistent <coughs> and you're ra they're raised in a healthy and happy society and home as the environment of home is happy and healthy they're going to be 90% okay so that's, they should not be afraid of that. Now, let's start with, uh, with love. We'll focus in, um, on a few things, and then um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave some time for questions at the end as well. First thing is, everyone knows the quality of time is very important. This is with your, with your wife's husband, and this is the same thing with the kids. Spending quality time is very important. And everyone knows it's hard to have quality without quantity. You have to spend time, and it has to be undivided attention. Example, supper time. You come home, and this is, a, again, everything that I say now applies to spouses within husband and wife as well. You come for supper, so how, how do you come in? You knock on the door, and you're texting. You're answering your emails. You're on who knows what, right? And that's how you come in. And even if you have some eye contact, you come in, but still, you're there, right? It's in your hand. The whole world is there. We all know, right? And with the kids, this doesn't work. They pick up that my father is not focused on me, right? Me and my wife have a rule, which I, 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 I'll share with you. And I think it's worthwhile for everyone to have this rule. When there is supper time and family sits, there is no contact with outside. Turn off your cell phones. Plug out the, the phone of the house if you have one. Anyone has a phone at home? Yeah. This is for old, old, old timers. Just turn everything off. I'm not available. I'm busy when I, I have, have a set time for supper. Make it, don't make any appointments. And that's the time for family. Sit around joke around, tickle them, whatever you want to do, it has to be something that is quality, valuable time with the family. And I, as, as you know, as some of you know, I, I run a rabbinic training organization in the East Coast. And one of the, basically, gurus of training um, in rabbinics is, is Abby Shulman, Rabbi Abby Shulman. He said a very cute thing. He said, whenever you get a call and you're with your family, you say, I'm sorry, I have staff meeting. And staff stands for special time available for the family. Mm -hmm. That's the staff meeting. And everyone should have those staff meetings every <coughs> single day at least once. Again, with the spouses, before kids, and after kids is the same. That's what builds the family up. When you have quality time, when you have undivided attention that you're giving to the other person. So that's time. You go on a trip. I used to be a frequent flyer and often I would find myself sitting there in the, in the waiting room for the flight and families were there with their kids clearly going on a trip this is not a business trip this is not a they're sitting there the mom is on a, on a smartphone the dad is on a smartphone and the kids are on tablets and smartphones mm. amazing they're spending family time <laughs> and on the plane, they're there till they tell them, please turn it off, and then they go to sleep. <laughs> Wonderful. Right? And Roy just showed me, and, you know, no offense to, to Roy's business, uh, one out of three kids, babies, under three years of age, work and play on tablets and phones. This is the society we live in. So now, you tell me. With, with no offense to anyone, everyone is good looking here, but which one is more attractive and interesting? The guy in the game or the father? You have no chance, we stand zero chance. There's no way, it's not gonna work. The kids get no attention, and then it builds up in them. My father has no relationship with me. My mother has no relationship with me. Right? Cooking and cleaning, or for some other 
circles and are going to salon and partying, or being on her phone on Amazon shopping is much more important than when I want her and I'm asking and I should. She says, hey, what do you need? Just tell me, honey. That's not the way that we can spend quality time with the kids or with our spouses. It has to be undivided attention, right? But as, as, as a fun thing, once I wanted to do, put a sign on the door, this is a phone-free zone. It's a phone-free zone. Don't bring it inside. Leave your business and stress and all of that outside the house. Shake it off before you come in and then enter the house. That should be the family quality time. That's the A. It's very important. Now, the second thing is, especially those of us that are very nervous about raising children, we are very on top. It could be on top of their, their school things. Did you do your homework? What happened? This serious talk. Serious talk with kids is good sometimes, but you have to learn how to just relax with the kids. Schmooze with them, talk with them, tickle them, go on the floor, play, bring Legos. Just like we have crises in life sometimes, and we have big issues, and then we look at our four, five-year-old and say, you know, good old days, problem-free, stress-free, that's not correct. The kids, and this is psychologically proven, they have their crisis. If their best friend says something to them in the school and says, I'm not talking to you anymore, that could be a crisis for a five-year-old. And they deal with it as we deal with crises in our lives. So we can't ignore it and say, okay, what do they know about life? Just go play with, with your Legos and you'll be good. They need attention, they need the, the love and the care. You know, sometimes just sitting and going and you know, don't care about your, your newly you know, iron shirt or whatever it is, it is. Go on the floor, play with them, and show them that you understand them. I always say that the, the best friends of my cleaners are my kids. It always stains all over and I don't even know it. And before, it doesn't last more than two, two, two days. Because the, that's what it is when you have a bunch of kids, different age, they're crawling up, coming. And if you don't do that, they, what they see, is, it's not important what we see, what they see is that my father does not understand me. Imagine this, you could, you could make it more understandable, thinking about the differences of, of, of men and women, right? If someone's food burns, this is her piece of art that now just burnt because she forgot to turn it off. So if you say, oh, what's a big deal, just go buy something. Is that sensitive? No. And, and so could be the, the reverse. Just like the, we have differences and we have to be tuned into the language of the other person, kids have their own language. And if we're not sensitive to their emotions, the way their emotions work as a little child that sees the world very in a limited eye, then we can't connect with them. So that's, that's the second thing. Again, it comes with playing balls and games and, 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 and all of those things. And we are busy, we come home, we have meetings, I'm talking about myself, yeah. The whole day running around, meeting with people, teaching, learning, giving lectures. I come home sometimes, I, at the end of the night, when my kids are sleeping, I say, okay, so how many minutes of quality time did I spend with each one of them? And sometimes it's embarrassing, it's less than five. In 1996, and this is before any smartphones, before internet, before um, you know, iPads and iPods and tablets, all of that. None of those existed. How many minutes do you think an average American parent spend with their kids? I shouldn't be the only talker here. Mm -hmm. Say something. 45 minutes. 25 minutes. 45 minutes. 45 minutes. 15 minutes. 100 minutes. 100 minutes. Auction? 100 minutes. Huh? Anyone else? 60 minutes. Anyone else? 4 minutes. 4? Four? 4. 4 minutes. Anyone else? 5 minutes. Oh, 1 dollar, 1 dollar. There we go. And how many minutes on media? Weekly. This one was, I don't know why they did it like this. 
How many minutes on TV? Back then, back, back then was only TV. 96. Hmm? It's like three this hours. This is 1996. Every three hours a day on average? 24. Hmm? <laughs> 24. 24? Over 45 hours of TV weekly. Okay? This is before cell phones, before all of the things that we have nowadays. Like who's raising our kids? The, the media, the outside world. We, we don't get to spend quality time with our kids. So it's important in that little time that we have, there's not time for serious talks sometimes. Get relaxed with your kids. Spend quality time. A time that they could cherish. They could say to themselves, my daddy is my best friend. My daddy understands me. Is on the money on the ball. That's how we want our kids to think about us. My mom, my mom is the same way. Actually. <laughs> Talking to myself. <laughs> now another thing is, you have to show them that you care when they talk. You could have a little kid come home and say, "I have an issue." Again, it's for us might sound funny, but they have their issues. The kids have issues, and they want to talk it out. Right? Rachel said this, he did this to me, and you don't even know who these people are. They're, they're friends in school. Right? And at this, at this, I'm talking about, again, I'm talking about myself. I don't always know who all the friends are. I try to keep up with all of them. But eye contact, looking them in the eye and nodding your head as if that's the only focus that you have, that's very important. Showing that you really care about what they're saying. And sometimes even saying, Oh, that's that. That must have felt like this. Well, really, this is what happened. And you just carry the conversation with them. It's something. Again, this is social, social, social skills even between people and their the workers, people and spouses. But with the kids, is no less than that. Again, we we tend to think the kids don't have that much needs. They have their Legos. They have their um, you know tablet, whatever else they have, and they're busy. So I'll just pat them on the back and that's it. If they come to you, they want to talk. Just like you would do it to an adult. Look at them in the eyes, nod your head, and sit them on your lap. And listen to what they have to say. Because that could take care of 90% of the issue. They have a hard, hard time, they have a hard day, they come home, they just want to air out. And just sitting and listening, for them to know they have a parent that loves them, it's 90% of the thing. Because there's no real solution. So if someone hurt them in this school, so what are you going to do? And to say, I'm going to come speak to the parent. Okay, that's one thing. That's not what they want. They want to know, he hates me. At least that's what he says. Do you love me? That's what they're asking. And showing that you love them, and you care, and you're listening, and you're there, and you're focused, undivided attention, that's 90% plus of the issue. So that's very important. And that brings us to, to bedtime, which is extremely important. So what is bedtime in my house? And energetic kids to sleep in the le least time possible. But that's not, that's not what it is. That's not what it is. What it really is, is that bedtime is the only, by some, some kids, is the only time that they're fully relaxed. They're ready to hear you. And they're ready to talk. Some kids, they've been hurt, or they've had some issue, they had a bad day, they had a cold, they had whatever it is, they were in a bad mood, and they keep it in. When they're going to sleep, they're relaxed, they could start talking, they could start crying sometimes, and that's the time that you listen to them. And that's the time that you, you sit, you read a book with them, you put them to sleep with calmness, you tell them you love them. And that's extremely important, extremely important. Again, this might not apply yet to people who don't have kids of over three or four, that they're, they're sleep trained. What's that? Yeah, I mean, you know, but whenever they're sleep trained and they understand and they talk and so on and so forth, that's the time. But again, this is something that you build up in yourself. The, the, the structure of a family is not that, you know, bedtime is torture. Go to sleep. Why did you come out? That's not necessarily the, the desired bedtime. 
The bedtime routine is a time to connect with the kids, to read for them the book, and to lie down sometimes, you know, on, on the bed and cuddle with them, and, and so on. So this is something extremely important because it builds their self-confidence. It builds in them that you love them, and they count, and they're coming. They're going to sleep with <coughs> with calmness rather with stress. That takes care of much of their um, you know their dream issues and their nightmares and all those things. So that's extremely important. How, how they go to sleep at night is how they're going to wake up next day in the morning. And sometimes you find yourself falling asleep on the bed with them because you uh, you had a stress day and you you miss your things. You burn your cake or whatever it is that was in the oven or on the stove. But this is something important, it's something very important to, to be tuned into the needs of the kid and to spend that quality time with them and not let them go. Um, another thing I wrote over here for myself is the feeling that I'm getting recently. And that is the kids grow up extremely fast. You know, I can't believe that my, my son is as old as he is. And Another nine, ten years from now, he's going to be in, a, in school, in, in yeshiva, out in East Coast. Who knows where he's going to be? The kids grow up extremely fast. Cherish the time that you have with your kids. You're going to grow up. You can say, ah, you know, I wish I, I had this, I had spent more time with them. And this is like a catch twenty-two because usually the young families before the mid forties, they're working hard to make it to establish themselves and so on and so forth. And those are the stressful years of life. After that, when they're established, the kids are out. So it's, it's hard to, to manage in a way that you put all the stress out and you spend that time. But it's very important. And time passes very quick. Before you know it, they, they grow up and they go to school in, in their mid-teens, as we are going to speak um, several times about this. The research shows, this is very heavily backed up research, that the, the teenagers listen to their to their parents, to their to their friends much more than they, they listen to their to their parents. They become, you know, people of their groups, people that identify with friends and so on and so forth. And much of that is because parents have not spent enough quality time with them. They don't consider their parents as someone that understands their their issues, their their problems, their emotional status and so on and so forth. So that's Another thing to, to keep in mind, time goes extremely fast. And sometimes, you know, it, it pays to take the kids out on a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Take them out for a walk. You know, just the other night I took each one of my kids out for <coughs> a 10-minute walk, around four blocks. And it's extremely important for them because they feel important that you pull them out of the whole thing. You know, the other kids are home, you take them, you give them a hug, you put their, your hand around them, and you walk with them, you talk with them, uh, what their goals are, what their issues are, how their feelings are, what their friends are, all of those things. You take a walk with them, you take them to ice cream, you know, if you like ice cream, I, I love ice cream. And you know, sometimes they don't finish it, I finish it for them. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's, that's something important to, to keep in mind, take them to pizza. It, it should be done on a schedule, put it on your on your schedules, once a, once a month, twice a month, whatever, once a week, whatever it is, then you could afford the time. Give them that individual importance that they feel, wow, my mother took me out to ice cream, my father took me out to pizza. And that's something, something extremely important. When, when, when you listen to them on a one-on-one -on -one base, when they get the time with you, and it's a different setting, it's not at home or in their room or in the playground, it's in a restaurant, it's for a walk, you go take them to a park. That's something that's extremely important. And that's quality of time. And now, I want to tell you the price that the person sometimes pays for being too busy. And this, you know, I would say to, uh, to a crowd of, 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 of rabbinic students, but it's the same, same is true with, with any crowd. There is one of the um, medieval you know, the, 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 the Mefarshim, the um, commentaries on, on Tanakh, on the Bible, that says, his name is Ralbag, that Ralbag writes on the story of Shemuel. Shemuel, 
Hanavi was the greatest, one of the greatest of the Nevi'im, of the prophets that he had. In many ways, he was compared to be greater than Moshe and Aaron combined, Moses and Aaron combined, right? The Navi tells us that his kids were not like himself, they were not as great as him, and therefore they did not merit to lead the nation after his, their father. And says the Lakral back, you know why this happened? Because Shmuel was always busy taking care of other people. He was running around the country, he was the prophet, he was going, today he was in this city, the other day was this city, he was running around serving the community. Serving the community is an amazing thing. There is nothing like it. We have people sitting in this room with us now that their service to the community is invaluable. In the time and the effort and the insights, everything. And there is nothing like it. The clan Israel, our nation does not run without those people who do this. But at the same time, you have to be careful that it should not be taking away quality time from the family. All that we do for others and for outside and for establishing our business and our house and all of that is good and is necessary, but the kids really demand and want and deserve a tremendous care and love and time with, with, with the parents that nothing else, no one else could be their parents. It's only us. They're stuck with us as one father and one mother and we have, we, we have the burden on us try to establish that relationship, a healthy, happy relationship that they could laugh with us, they could trust us with their problems, they could, they could talk to us about everything. And that is the positive thing. 80% to 20, or 90 to 10, the truth, the honest truth is, I think, and I tell this to some of my, my people, my students, the ones who have security cameras at home, I say, watch the security camera between 6 to 9 at home and see yourself dealing with the kids. And often you find that we are 80 to 20, but the other way around. Don't do this, don't do that. It's negativity and, and, and telling them and bossing around. And, you know, again, it's, much of that is needed, but 80 to 20 is something <coughs> you should keep in mind. To encourage them, to pat them in the back, and to, to be there for them in a positive way, in encouragement, it's, in, it's a magic. What, what encouragement could do, and we're gonna discuss this in a lot of research, a lot of interesting things in the next sessions to come. Encouragement could do miracles. So keep this in mind, that the only way to raise a healthy family is to, to have this ratio of 80 to 20. The primary relationship should be of love, care, and, and being there for the kids. And then we're gonna discuss next time, hopefully, about some, some things about this event. Now we, we're gonna have some questions, if you have, yes. Um, the, the idea of you know, instituting things like, for example, like every night, you know, having dinner time together, how, how do you incorporate that without making it, like, you have to come to dinner, it's dinner, you know, without making it too serious and like a, like a chore. Or a okay, so that's a very good question. Well, do you have to give a candy to your kid to watch your a movie? Question. The question is, how do you, if we, we spoke about the importance of, you know, having a dinner time, supper time, together, family time, once a day, something strong. And he's asking, how do you do that without being bossy? You know, come, you know, he's playing, he's doing something, you know, you have to be here. You know, then I tell you ten times, and you know, they're not coming, they're playing, they're reading a book, they're on the couch, whatever, they're relaxing, unwinding. How do you get them to the table to spend that time with them? Say, my rabbi said you have to come. <laughs> right? That's not going to work. What I tell people usually is, do you have to bribe your kids to, to play a game, a new game? No. You have to give them a candy? No. Why? Because they like to do it. It's interesting. It pays. If it's interesting, if it's the time that is... Sometimes it, it, it means great desserts that they get only in, in that time. Something that they really love. Sometimes it means... Um, the, you know, again, it depends on the kid and the, and the age. This is... You can't give rules because... You know, kids with more intellect, it's easier to say that if they are getting their emotional needs 
mat on the table, it's much easier for them to tell. So if it does happen for older age, for more intellectual kids, but often it's just, if it's great. If the experience is something that they look forward to, because there's great things on the table that they like, and it's fun, and you're singing, and you're all together, and it's just enjoyable, you don't have that, that much of a challenge. Like maybe like using plates or something, like cartoon plates. Yeah, you could, you could be creative as much as you can, but it's, 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 if you find yourself pulling them with the sleeves to come, it's not the way to do it. They have to want to run to it. That's, you make it interesting, be creative, plates, whatever you want, net nosh, anything that works. <laughs> yes. But, uh, um, you mentioned like the special outings, like walks and you know pizza and whatnot. And so, how important do you think it is for kids to do like adventurous things and trips and have experiences and go to you know go to, go to parks and go on vacation things like that? Or, or is it really for them at that level? Is it really just more important to bond? And you know, if you give them enough of that, they're not going to need bigger and more. That's a very good question. The main thing is the bond. Meaning, even if you're living in the most simple situation and you don't go, look, people 100 years ago, they didn't go on so many trips. And it's just become, the, the media has made a whole lifestyle out of this. You know, it's, they feed you that if you're not going to Europe twice a year and this, you're not a complete family. It's not true. You know, that's not a need. The, the, the bond, the emotional bond with the kids, it's an absolute ne necessity for them to grow up. Just like the water for plants is a necessity, the bond is a necessity. However, it's very important to have some change. But change is subjective. If you get your kids used to three Europe trips a year, so after two years, by the time the, the fourth month comes, they're you know, new, it's time to go. And you're building a lot of expectation. And they have to live up to that when they grow up as well. And it just becomes bigger. So it takes some, some measure of thoughtfulness to know when and how and, and where. And that's, that's something that's extremely needed. Outings, it could be parks, it could be anything. But it depends on the level of the family, you know, the level of luxury that they want to get accustomed to, and many other things. So when you're saying to spend quality time, when there's like more than one child, like how do you, what do you do with the other kids that are not getting that quality time? Like how do you separate that one child from the rest to give them that attention? When the other kids probably want to come and talk to you. Right. So, so it depends. Sometimes when they come, um, let's say from school, and they come all together. So you can't just pull one of them out. They're excited, they want to see you, they want to crawl up on top of you and you know, you spend time with all of them together at that moment. But later on, when they're calm and they're doing their own things, especially if they know that it's not only this guy that gets it, it's everyone, and sometimes he gets it first and then I got it first, then they're okay with it. They you know, they know it's my time, and then it's his time, sometimes he's first, and then I'm next. And this is a healthy thing, when we get to discipline, we'll discuss that. It's okay for kids to know you don't always get the same size of, of, of the cake as your brother or sister got. Sometimes you get bigger. So I, I, I don't have to go bring a measure. And, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be like that. Sometimes you get the bigger one, sometimes you get the bigger one, which is how it is. As long as they know it's fair, and you know, even if they say it's not fair, if you're really fair and deep down they know it's fair, it's fair. And they're going to be okay with it. However, like in families that have a bunch of kids, like let's say they have um, five, six kids, and they're about the same age, and you can't take all of them, you have 20 minutes. So you could take them out in groups, you know, take them two of them at a time, and the ones who are better match with each other, and so on and so forth. And that will be okay. If they know that you care about having individual time, that doesn't. And what, at what age does that usually start where you're letting the other children know that I'm spending Quality time with her or him right now? Well, look, usually usually the little kids, um, the wa walking outside and taking it, appreciate and understand that this is my time and that, that they cherish it. It doesn't have to be there for a two year old, 
But yeah, you know, I mean, three, four, five already, depending on how, how much they're tuned into what's happening in the family. And that, again, it depends from every child's difference. Some kids, they're very intuitively smart about what's happening, all the details. And they tell you, two months ago you did this, and they have it all like, rattled off exactly. So that kid is telling you that I care about this, even though that is young. But usually, normal is you know, three and up is, is the time that, that they start them. So I guess. I have a hard time with my daughter talking about school. Like when she comes home, she doesn't want to talk about it. She's five, right? She what? She is five. She's four. Four. Fair enough. Her husband's is five. Almost. We men never remember. I don't know the birthday of my kids. It's fine. I have so, a lot of stories to tell you about it. So yeah, she's five. And um, when she comes home, she doesn't want to talk about school. She doesn't want to talk about anything that has to do with school. And sometimes I have to like trick her to get stuff out of her, but I want her to talk to me about it. I just don't know how to get it out of her. So sometimes, again, it depends. I, I don't know her, and this is... It depends on, on you know few variables and different different kids are different. But often when they when they are closed is because they just don't want to remember or talk about the school. They want to relax at home and they want that, that that quality time with the parents. And often if you do that and give it to them and they relax and, and the bed the bedtime thing that we mentioned, sometimes they just open up then and they say, Yeah, this 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 thing happened, that thing happened, yeah, that thing happened. But part of it also, some kids are just, in, by nature, they're much more private. Some kids are so open, they come, the first thing they tell you is the rundown of the whole day. And they can't <laughs> stop talking about it. And they tell it to you twice and three times. And, and some kids are just, they go and they go to their cocoon and they don't want to talk about anything. And it's their nature. You know, and you see that's in their entire personality. Some of them they, they're giving out everything to everyone, they're just outward. And other ones are keeping and storing things, they're inward. And it, it really does have to do with the personality. But some of it is, is, is training them that it's, I'm part of your life, just like you're part of my life. And it, it builds up. Again, sometimes you have to bite your tongue and wait, and it, it grows afterwards. But if that relation, the close relationship is there, that we're best friends, then automatically she wants to share with me her life. But again, kids are different. But that's, yes? So I have a problem with my wife. Um, oh, no. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I think my wife is a pushover. But maybe you can explain this to me. It's so, the 80 20 thing. Okay, yeah. So I have two wonderful kids, they're four or five years old. And we go for breakfast, and the kids want pasta. And my wife says, okay. And in the afternoon, they want pizza. And my wife says, okay. And then they want ice cream, they want candies, they want chocolate, they want this. She never says no to them. And of course, I do. And I'm more half conscious, I guess. And I, I don't believe whatever you put in your stomach today, maybe 10, 20, 30 years, has consequences, health, you know, wise. But she never says no to them. And I'm just puzzled. I mean, pizza, pasta, and then. I mean, one day we had an incident at home where the, where the freezer melted. Oh, I mean, everything was just melted, right? And you would think you have meat and vegetables and good food. I, swear, I, I promised you there was just ice cream melting. I mean, it was the cake was that, sounds, that, that sounds like my freezer. Uh, and then she had the cake from first year birthday. Okay, so now I got, I got the picture. Let me tell you. Okay, maybe you can talk to her a little bit. Maybe it's a <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, I, I counsel people privately. You can talk to me. Maybe it's a session, a dozen sessions. Okay, so now I have, I, have, I want to make a comment on your question. I, 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 one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say, you know, get them vegetable. And then the answer is they don't like vegetables. <laughs> I'm like, this can't be real. You know? Eat the vegetables, you and if you don't have vegetables, there's no food. And if they're hungry enough, they will eat their vegetables. No, they don't like vegetables, so I don't feel what they do. <laughs> <laughs> is it me? Is it her? Is it, uh, it's, 
it's, it's, it's both. Let me tell you some, some rundown of information on, on my kids. I have a child that for past seven years has not touched meat. Okay? That's because he doesn't eat it. Right? And we did all the things that you said and some more. And uh, some kids are more tough, and the more you talk of them, the more they resent it and they backfire. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, next session, when we're going to speak about discipline and authority, this is going to be one of the big things that we're going to talk about. And some of it, meaning we're going to address much of this, this issues of when you say no and how do you say no, and when you say no, how much do you stick to it? How much you don't go back? Because if they learn that you go back, then they always try it. It's a matter of how hard they have to push. Right? Versus if they know this is an iron wall. If the no was said, it's a no. And how much to say no is a whole different story. Because if you say no, 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 then you become a broken, a broken tape recorded. It's a no, 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 no. And then it's as soon as they could get out of the house. That's the date that they can get out of the house. So that's it. It's a balance between both of them. N ne neither one is the solution. And um, this really is a topic by itself, which is going to discuss next time. So I'm not going to answer that part. But some of it is also a culture. We, sp we spoke, I mean, you asked that question last time. You know, how do you deal with this? That you, know, you have to try them to eat the healthy food and stuff. Sometimes you have to, sometimes you don't have to. It, 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 it depends, see there's a culture within your half Persian, right? Mm -hmm. So your mother was not, that's correct? Well actually they're both Persian, it's both all Persian. All Persian? Yeah. Okay, good. So, <laughs> I, I, I heard different things. Um, <laughs> if I half is German, but okay good, it's all good. So within some of the, some of the Persians at least, it's a big thing to chase your kids with food, and you see, like, and I, I took pictures of my, we, we, we had a family event in a park. And I started, like, um, unbeknownst to people, I started taking videos of them. And then I showed it to them. They're all rolling on the floor. Like, with a spoonful, they're running after the kid. Please eat it. And I was like, yeah. He eats. If you don't make a big deal out of it, they're hungry. It's a natural thing in your body. You get hungry, you eat. <laughs> That's, yeah. Don't don't chase after them. They don't have to. They don't, yeah. But at the same time, the kids who have sensory issues, the texture of certain things bother them, and it's a serious thing. It's not a. It's not that they're trying to get back at you or this. It's just they can't have it. It really bothers them, and it stays with some of this these people till the end of their life. They just don't like the texture of vegetable or food or something that's cold and wet, or something that's hot and wet, all kinds of things. And sometimes you have to speak to a therapist for, for some of the things, and it's just how it is. But again, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's not good to only have candies and cake and then that. But at the same time, at the same time, it has to be dealt with um, a moderated thing. You can't just say, okay, stop. We, and Going with what we said in the very beginning, which was a um, synapses of the thing, you should have a united front. Whatever you say to them should be not in front of them. Go to a restaurant together, once a week go out and have a meeting where they can't hear you, you want to scream at each other, you want to talk to each other, you want to write it. But in front of them, if they know that my, my mommy said this, I said, oh, your mom said you can have it, okay. I'll speak to her next, for next time. She probably forgot to ask me also. So, in front of them, you're one person. The more that they see that, oh, I can't get this from, from my father, I go to my mother. I can't get it from my mother, I go to my father. Then they start playing with you. And that's just not smart, not healthy. That, that united front, keeping the united front is, is very important, despite the, the frustration. Can I have a question, please? Yes. Okay, so we have an issue with homework. But a child bringing home homework. So You're the only one that has the problem. <laughs> no, but it's a real, I mean, it's been going on. So how do you know when not to push it? When you say, okay, it's okay if you, if you don't, I mean, 
you don't want to suffocate the child. Like, where's your homework again? Why didn't you bring it? But at the same time, you don't want every day that they come home, they're scared to open their backpack and show you, I forgot to bring my homework in. So how do you balance that? And then maybe it is, okay, maybe some boys are more forgetful, so you have to be a little more lenient. So how do you, how do you balance okay, that? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a very loaded question because, um, see, right now, the numbers, I mean, it's just unbelievable, the numbers that they have out there. Some schools, half of the school are on, on or la close to half of the school are on different medications for attention disorders and this and the ADD, a ADHD and DDD and all those, every, every <laughs> disease that you could, you could imagine they're there. And not all of them are ne necessary if right steps would be taken towards dealing with the issue. But some of the kids do have some attention things and they are more forgetful, as you said. But that doesn't mean that your kids are, are, are that way. It could be for a thousand more reasons. If you make it, it's like the same thing as with potty training. If you make it that it becomes their goal to do it, then they won't forget it. It's much less likely to forget it if it's something that becomes their project. So without telling them, because now they are on the defensive, and especially boys are much more like that, that they're the own people, you know, I, I happen to know Yosef a little bit, and you know, it's, 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 it's their thing that you can't say, oh, you forgot it again. It's that you make it their project, and then they'll be on top of it. But again, this is more of a, a question that has to be discussed privately based on many other things. Okay. Yes. So, I always feel we're pressured for time. In the morning, we're rushing to get up to school. You know, they, I, how do you get the kids to realize the concept of time, that you only have one hour to get ready, and you keep reminding them what time it is, but they just don't, <laughs> don't get it. Okay. And then it's like all day long. So in the morning it's like that, and when they come home, it's like, I feel like I'm always rushing them, and I feel so bad. And I was like, hurry up, come to your homework, hurry up, come eat dinner, hurry up, let's go to bed. Okay, so this also really falls under the, the authority thing the next time. But again, it's short, I'm, I'm not going to answer it basically. Because mm -hmm. for that, we have some basic things to discuss before we get there. But um, but some, some of it is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you know that you have to pack lunches and to do other things and find their sock in uh, the middle of the whole pile of laundry and so on and so forth. If you could do that at night, then the morning time could be spent with them, maybe giving them a massage on the back till they wake up or singing to them till they go, whatever else it takes. Sometimes it takes something <laughs> more creative. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we, have, we have a child that's exactly like that. You know, she, it's um, she wants to take her time and do it and and it's all amazing and it was frustrating in the beginning but we we got the hang of it in a way that now when she wakes up and there's something that she's looking forward to that became her own thing and it's not that she, she's being pushed to do something rather she wants to do it because she's excited to do something in school whatever the the, the, the steps that we took it could be when you make it that this, their excitement in life, their project, their, their thing, then they will be much, much more open to it. But it has to do with other things too. I mean, sometimes it's because of the stress they had yesterday in the school and they, it was never talked out. So they just subconsciously don't want to go to school. I mean, they, want, they don't want to go to school because they, want to, they don't want to face their friend that hurt them with verbally or whatever. So then automatically they don't want to get up, even though they're not telling it to you. And, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it could be many different reasons, but if it's something that's the personality of the child, then it has to be dealt with, you know, through the authority methods and you know, the, through making it exciting, making it their project. I have a quick question about technology. Um, kind of a just an interesting subject nowadays because, um, like, I can look back and say I wasn't raised with any TV or anything, and I was in a total bubble. And until I was older, that bubble didn't break. But I kind of look at the world nowadays and think, I'd love to do that with my kids, yet 
it's just not as it's it's not as easy, and it's also maybe not as practical because life is so much more technologically sort of inclined. And I think that kids have to have some exposure so that they're not clueless when they enter the adult world. How do you find that balance, or even more so with the fact that every other kid they're going to know, cousins, anybody that they're close with too, is going to have that iPad or have the TV on in the background or whatever it is? Okay, it's two things. Again, this is a little bit of a broader subject, which uh, also falls some of it under the authority, including limits. Um, but very quick, two points is one, you have no idea how quick they could catch up to to out there. It's, they're not, these are kids who within a few days they, they know, you know, we're going to we're going to have a whole talk about technology and and the influences and so on and so forth. We're going to have a talk about that. This is after it's probably two or three sessions from now, but um, but um, you know they catch up very quickly. And then the second point is just because their friends are on the on the TV or anything else five hours a day doesn't mean that they have to be the same way. They could have like you know. Our family, we, we are, we have other things to do, and it's exciting. Our, it's, you know, we, 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 we tell our kids the Israelis don't need that. You know, we don't need to spend time. And I, I explain to the older ones, and this is something that that is really true for us to think. If I grew up putting pieces of puzzle together and building and making, and I had to sit and and, and break my head on it to figure it out, and, it, and that taught me two things. One, to sit and do a project for more than an hour straight. Two, to use my brain. When you're dealing with technology, first of all, you're being entertained. And as the more interesting that is, the more boring the world is. So you kind of tune into that. Secondly, this is a study also old, about 10 years old. Sesame Street is the um, the the most harmless thing that you can imagine, right? Every the screen of Sesame Street changes every three seconds. Used to now it's uh, I think one point seven or two point two. I don't remember what it is. Uh, now it's changed, right? And the brain of the child gets subconsciously gets used to foc the, the 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 focus span of two or three seconds. And that, that causes the ADD and all the other things that, that the attention span disorders and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I told this to my, to my son. And he understood it. He was, he was older, he was eight at the time. But he still goes to, to, my, uh, to my relatives. We don't have a TV at home. And they, they, they like it that they don't have a TV at home. They, they, that much they have, they have gotten. But they go there, they play games, they do different things. And they have fun. They appreciate. They come home. They read their books. They they're busy with the things. You know, my son now knows everything that there is to know about Europe and this and maps and where is it. But and he has found a channel of 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 interest for himself through finding out about these things, reading about animals, about this, and that really satisfies him because when he speaks to his friends, they know nothing compared to him. They're just entertained the whole day. And he could sit and do things that they can't do. He figures out like puzzles and this and that in a matter of seconds where, while it takes them. So that's something that, that boosts his own self, self-confidence and self-belief. But again, this is not a short thing. It, it, it's very, very complex. Because if you're sending your kids to the school, that the values of the school is different than the values of the house. So you're up for, for battle. If uh, your neighbors... It's, it's a very intertwined and complex thing that has to be discussed, but that's why we're going to have a whole thing for the knowledge of yes. do, do you think um, it's necessary at all with grandparents to try to, um, you know, monitor like how they, like if there's something you disapprove of, like, you know, don't talk to them like that, or like, is that necessary, or should we just let that relationship evolve without... It depends how aggressive they are. Right. That's why we invited all the grandparents to come to this talk. They said so you want to control the kids. You know, we're not going to to okay. Thank you for listening.